Good morning. So glad, so glad to see all of you here today. and So glad that those of you who are watching and listening online could join us as well. One of my favorite Dr. Seuss stories is Horton Hatches the Egg. If you haven't read Horton Hatches the Egg in a while, I encourage you to revisit it and read it out loud to your kids, your grandkids, your favorite pet, preferably a dog. It'll go right over your cat's head. Cats don't appreciate Horton. They saunter out in the middle of the story. But read it to your dog. Your dog will appreciate Horton. As Horton hatches the egg, tells the story of Horton the elephant, who is tricked into sitting on an egg by the egg's mother, Maisie the bird, who goes on an extended, i.e. permanent, vacation to Palm Beach. And Horton promises Maisie that he will take care of her egg. And he does. Even though he has to endure all kinds of hardships and ridicule along the way. At the end of the story, spoiler alert, the egg hatches and out pops this creature that's half elephant, half bird, but looks more like Horton than it does Maisie. And throughout the story, when Horton is asked to explain why he won't get off that egg... He says these words over and over again. He says, I meant what I said. A few of you have read this story. I meant what I said. I said what I... An elephant is faithful 100%. I meant what I said. I said what I meant. And an elephant is faithful 100%. That's what Horton said. And I cannot think of a better way to introduce or to illustrate today's fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. Faithfulness has to do with being a reliable, dependable, trustworthy person. Psalm 15 describes the prototypical righteous person who can enter the tent of the Lord or who can dwell on the mountain of the Lord. And one of the characteristics of such a person is listed in verse 4. It says, who can live in your tent, Lord? Who can dwell on your holy mountain? Verse 4, someone who keeps their promise even when it hurts. Just like Horton. More importantly, though, just like God. Throughout the scriptures, God's faithfulness is listed as one of the core attributes of God when God's people are explaining why God is praiseworthy, when they're ascribing greatness to God. They say things like this in Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever His faithfulness continues through all generations. The faithfulness of God shows up in psalms of praise like this one, but it also shows up in songs of lament like the one in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22. This is when the Lord's people are hurting. They're being carried off into exile. Jerusalem, the temple has been destroyed and It says in verse 3, 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. If someone were to ask an ancient Israelite, How do you know God is faithful? You say it all the time. You sing it all the time. You pray it all the time. How do you know that God is faithful? Not only when things are going well, but when things are really bad, you always say, well, God is faithful. How do you know that? 
And that ancient Israelite would likely respond to that question by telling the story of the Exodus. By telling the story of how God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt. Defeated Pharaoh and his army. Led his people through the Red Sea and across the wilderness and across the Jordan River into the promised land. And they would tell that story and then they would explain how in doing all of those things, God is keeping his promises to Abraham, their forefather. It's back in Genesis, God bound himself to Abraham. Made a pledge and a promise to Abraham. He told Abraham, I will bless you with a large family that will become a nation, Israel. And not only will I bless you and your family, but I'm going to bless the whole world through your family. Your name will always be associated with blessing. And Israel celebrates God's faithfulness because through the Exodus story and other mighty acts, God reveals God's self to be not just a promise maker, but a promise maker keeper in the last few days of an election season when promises are flying around faster than Maisie on her way to Palm Beach it's easy to see why Israel held on to and celebrated God's faithfulness because anybody can make a promise that's easy The challenge is keeping it, especially when it hurts. And it is impossible to overestimate how much pain God endures in order to keep his promises. There's a passage in Deuteronomy 32 that summarizes the essence or the source of God's pain. This is Moses speaking. He says in Deuteronomy 32 verse 3, he says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. That's familiar territory. That's why God is great. That's why God is good. God is faithful. That's Moses ascribing the greatness of God to God. So where's the problem? It comes in the next verse. Moses says, they, speaking of God's people, they, not God, they are corrupt and not as children. To their shame, they are warped and crooked. They are a warped and crooked generation. Is this the way you repay the Lord? You foolish and unwise people, is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? God is faithful. His people are not, Moses says, not even a little bit. And over and over again throughout the scriptures, God's people respond to their promise-keeping God by breaking their promise to worship God and God alone. And the one-sided nature of this relationship is captured in the story of Hosea. Hosea is a prophet of God. And God commands Hosea to marry and then stay faithful to, stick with a spouse who is unfaithful to him. And God has Hosea do this because God wants to demonstrate how painful it is, how hard it is to be faithful to a faithless people. And the tension between a faithful God and an unfaithful people is what pushes the biblical story forward all the way to Jesus, who on the cross embodies both God's faithfulness, but also the long-awaited faithfulness of God's people. On the cross, God in Christ is being faithful, keeping his promises. And on the cross, Christ 
is being faithful on behalf of Israel. Finally, God's faithfulness is met with faithfulness. And so the cross is the ultimate example, the ultimate picture of a promise-keeping God determined to do what he said he would do, to reverse the curse of sin and to bless all the world through Abraham's family. Even when it hurts. Even if it kills him. The biblical story is about a God who is faithful through and through from beginning to end. And as I've said throughout this series, the fruit of the Spirit then is evidence of the Spirit of God at work in us, making us more like Christ. We cannot grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, individually or collectively as a church, without the presence of God within us. Because it is the presence of a kind God within us that makes us kind. And it is the presence of a good God within us that makes us good. And it is the presence of a faithful God within us that makes us faithful. But only if we cooperate with the Spirit by cultivating the hard and weedy soil of our heart so that the Spirit has ample room to work in us. The fruit of the Spirit is a gift from God, but it also requires our hard work to eliminate navigate around or through the many obstacles that can keep it from growing in our lives. And one of the biggest weeds that could keep faithfulness from growing in us is the way our culture values disposability. My friend Luke Norsworthy tells a story of being in Australia. He's at a food court with some friends, and one of his Australian friends volunteered to go get everyone some cutlery. Cutlery. Luke didn't know what that was. He thought it was maybe something specifically Australian, like a Vegemite sandwich. And when his Australian friend returns with a handful of plastic forks and plastic knives, Luke asked him, why do you call it cutlery? And his friend said, well, what would you call it, mate? And Luke said, I would call it silverware. And his friend said, it's not made of silver, mate. Which is why we have no problem throwing away a plastic fork. It's disposable. You use it once and you get rid of it. Unless you're an 18-year-old boy in a dorm room, then you scrub it with your toothbrush and it's ready for the next cup of noodles. And to say we live in a disposable culture doesn't mean that we don't value sustainability or that we don't recognize the importance of recycling. Of course we do. It just means that we have grown accustomed to getting rid of something when it outlives its usefulness to us. When something gets old, stops working, starts giving trouble, isn't living up to our expectations, no longer meets our needs, it is easier now than ever to get rid of it and order a new one. Order something better. Putting it in the recycle bin is still getting rid of it so we can buy something new or upgrade to something better. And it's worth considering how this disposable mindset, which we take for granted, it is a way of life. We likely don't recognize how much we dispose of stuff every day. It's worth considering, though, how this disposable mindset is subtly, or maybe not so subtly, shaping the way we enter into relationships. Because it's one thing to buy an outfit or a computer or a phone knowing you're going to get rid of it someday when it outlives its usefulness. But what happens when that easy come, easy go mindset, attitude bleeds into our friendships or into our church membership? What's to keep us from bailing on a friend when things get tough? 
like when we realize we voted for a different person? Or what's to keep us from jumping ship and going to a new church when somebody says something we don't like or something happens that we don't like or maybe just because there's a new shiny church building momentum down the street? Where's the line, or what is the line, between disposable utensils or silverware, electronics, or relationships? And if you've ever had someone throw you away when you were no longer useful to them, then you know sometimes there isn't one. So how can we grow in faithfulness when we are being trained by our culture to get rid of or move on from anything that doesn't function the way we want it to. Another obstacle that can keep faithfulness from growing in our lives is the way that our culture has perfected the art of being committed to being non-committal. We are committed to being non-committal. Think about the last time you declined an invitation or a request from someone that would cause you to commit yourself to something. What was your excuse? What was your reasoning? Why were you hesitant to commit? Well, maybe you're overcommitted and, and you're always saying yes, maybe that's it. But were there other reasons? As well? Why did you say no? Why, or why did you stiff arm and stall? I had my teeth cleaned on Thursday and immediately afterward, the hygienist wanted to schedule my next cleaning for May of next year. I thought, why do you want to tie me down so far in advance? What if something more enjoyable than getting my teeth clean, like being called for jury duty, comes up on that day? I want to keep my options open. Don't tie me down. Think about all the ways we maneuver around or dodge invitations and requests. With phrases like, we'll see. I love we'll see. That's a great phrase. I learned early on to use that one as a parrot. When the boys would say, can we do this? Can we go there? We'll see. Nicer than a no, less risky than a yes. Because you can always turn we'll see into a yes and be the hero. It's a surprise. But if you turn we'll see into a no, you're not breaking any hearts because you didn't make any promises. We'll see. How much or how many of our relationships are dominated by a mm, we'll see attitude? Or don't you love it when someone signs up to help or volunteers to show up for something and then they add at the very end, but don't count on me. I can't guarantee I'll be there. I'll try, we'll see, but don't count on me. I may not be there. If you've never had anyone say that to you, then you have never tried to recruit volunteers for church work. One of the first hard lessons you learn in church work is that not everyone who signs up shows up. We call them show flakes. They're flakes who don't show. And if ever everyone who signs up does show up, you better get ready because Jesus is about to show up too. The end is near. And I suppose it's preferable being non-committal, going around making commitments and promises that you can't or don't intend to keep. But I wonder, how, how does the Spirit within us strengthen our promise-keeping muscles if we never exercise them? So one of the ways we can cultivate faithfulness in our lives is by intentionally making commitments, making some promises that bind us to other people and then asking God to work in us so that we can become faithful as God is faithful. Depending on God to pour his faithfulness into us so that we can become better, more faithful friends, church members. 
and spouses. When I do weddings, I often say to the couple standing before me that marriage is one of the very best ways to become more like God. Marriage is one of the very best ways to become more like a promise-making and promise-keeping God. Marriage is one of the ways that God shows us how to be more like God, to be faithful as God is faithful. And when I preach on marriage, I always make it a point to say that marriage is not for everyone. And not everybody should be married. That Christian singles can grow in faithfulness in other ways. Committing themselves to friendships and church memberships without getting married. We like to say that marriages are made in heaven. But they're not. Some of them seem to be made in hell. Maybe your first one was, if you've gone through the nightmare of a divorce. But the truth is, marriages are made neither in heaven nor in hell. They are forged and fashioned right here on earth. When two broken and imperfect people pledge, bind themselves to one another... And then walk with each other through the ups and downs of life, learning what it means to be faithful to another broken and imperfect person. That's how God uses marriage to show us what faithfulness looks like. Back in August, the Wall Street Journal profiled Jack and Jerry Eccles. They've been married for 70 years. Jack is a longtime Baptist pastor. Jerry is the mother of their nine children. And five years ago, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and moved into a nursing home. And on March 12th of this year, Jack showed up, as he normally did, to spend most of the day with Jerry. And he was turned away because of the pandemic. And the next day he showed up with a suitcase full of clothes and other supplies. And the facility rented him a single room with a view of a brick wall. And he moved in. And he's been living there ever since. Taking care of Jerry feeding her three meals a day, making sure she gets her 40 ounces of liquid every day, wiping away the drips from her chin so they don't stain her clothes. And when asked why he was there, he said, we're married. I want to be with her. She took care of me for 70 years, and now it's my turn. Marriages are not made in heaven, but they can show us what God is like when the fruit of God's faithfulness takes root and begins to grow in our hearts. And so may the presence of God at work within us continue to grow us into people who make and keep our promises. Even when it's hard, and even when it hurts. May the Spirit of God at work within us continue to shape and form us into reliable, dependable, trustworthy promise-keeping people. May the Spirit of God at work within us continue to transform us into people who will someday hear God say to us, well done, good 
and faithful servant. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The evidence of the power of God at work in us is faithfulness. So let's stand and read out loud together these hopeful words from Paul out of 1 Thessalonians 5. Beginning in verse 23, he says, read with me, please. Now, may the God of peace himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at our Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this.